All righty. Welcome to Walter's Tours podcast, where we talk all things adventure, travel and tourism. And boy, oh boy, do we have a pretty mad adventurer with us at the moment. We have a gentleman by the name of Robbie O'Davis. Robbie O'Davis has done some amazing things, such as played State of Origin for Queensland. He's represented Australia in rugby league and also been the Clive Churchill winner in the 1997 Grand Final and obviously played for the Knights the whole, whole time. Does that sound about right, Robbie? Give myself more raps if you want. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, straight off Wikipedia, everything yeah, I've been... Husband of one, father of three. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> grandfather of one. <laughs> so, plenty of amazing things. Actually, I had a really good year that year. My first child was born in 97, so that was the, the first ah. grand final of the Clive Churchill medal. But I also won the Wally Lewis medal for the player of state of origin that year. So, mate, the only thing I didn't win was the Dally M, which is obviously the, the main player, like the... Uh, a Brownlow Medal or the yeah, yeah. MVP of the year, whatever else. Um, Quite American, a colourful career. Quite a so, colourful career in rugby league. <laughs> Amazing. Definitely. I was lucky, very lucky for such a little man. But the reason why, and thank you so much for coming down and be able to do this podcast, because there's so much Robbie that we don't know. Because a lot of people who play rugby league have gone on to do so many different things, but no one knows about it. Hmm. And that's what I really want to talk about. So, um, but before we do that, do you mind if we just look at some footy highlights to really show some of the Robbie O'Davis that we might not know. Oh, well, let's hope they're good. Well, we'll share some <laughs> insights of it, perhaps. So, James, you could just be able to have a quick look at some of the footage, especially... Said, mate, um, man big man now, you've probably seen this stuff. about a thousand <laughs> times. There'll be some people who've watched this have probably never seen it before, but if you're from Newcastle, you'd have seen it all the time. Now, it's... <laughs> 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 all right, that's actually the wrong footage, this one. <laughs> <laughs> It looks like someone has found. Um, it might have been the other one <laughs> that was sent on through. Yeah, I think it's a bit of a COVID competition going but, but at the moment on some, one of the shows saying who can do the best takeoff of the football players. Well, and some I, kids obviously had a go. Exactly. But I mean, that, that goes to show. I mean, this is back in 1997 and people yeah. are still hung on to it. People are still reliving it because it's become quite an iconic thing in rugby league and particularly that in Newcastle. Here's the actual footage well, of it. Well, the actual, yeah, you'll see this here. I couldn't believe for a start the two Johns boys would actually pass the ball to me because they're superstars. But I, I end up getting the ball to Johns if you, if you want to go ahead with it and we'll see how we go. <clears throat> so we've got the Johns boys pass and then all of a sudden what become iconic was actually the dance, which was the Jigger Joy out of the Last Boy Scout. The Jigger Joy. Jigger Joy from out of the Last Boy Scout by Bruce Willis. <laughs> I, was watching, <laughs> I was watching the movie a week before. <laughs> so that's where it came from, yeah, Bruce Willis. So when he got victory, he'd done the Jigger Joy on the top of the, the light set tower, Bruce Willis did in the Last Boy Scout. And that was, that was it, I think, other than Nutbush City Limit that year, um, the Jigger Joy was the number one dance move hanging around Newcastle. <laughs> I've always <laughs> no, wanted no royalties, that. No royalties from it. <laughs> so I was actually at that game, I think I was about 12, yep. and just going absolutely nuts. I mean, the whole town went bloody crazy when, when the Newcastle actually made the grand final. So it's the, the Jigger... What is the it? Jigger joy. The Jigger Joy. The Jigger Joy. Bruce Willis in The Last Boy Scout. Yeah, he goes yeah. around and cleans them all up the way a movie goes, <laughs> and at the end he got up, right up the light, light, um, the light tower, and he just stood on the light tower and just did this stupid dance. And then I seen Adam McDougall, one of my... Uh, Teammates come towards me, the, the man shake himself, and as he come towards me, for some reason, I just whack my arm around just to say, come here, you big bass, and I'll give you a cuddle. <laughs> so, yeah, and uh, it, it was good. Went down to history that within the next two weeks, everyone in Newcastle had actually done the, the oh, jig man. of joy. It, st it still happens now. That's the yeah. thing. Yeah? There was footage up, it's oh, 2020, and it's still happening. You, you've you've yeah. made something cultural iconic around Newcastle. If I have a couple of beers, I'll always do it. <laughs> Oh, and um, just James, if we could just look at one more career highlight. There was a picture that I sent through. Um, I believe, and to your credit, mm -hmm. but just by coincidence, because we were talking prior to this podcast, we're in the Crown of Anchor, Crown and Anchor Hotel, and you actually auctioned off the jersey where jersey. this game actually Caribbean happened. In this very, look at that. I give it a wash, but so this happened in the last minute of a game in 2003. So it actually got put on. If you ever <laughs> want to hit a um, pornographic magazine, oh, I actually... Got on the inside of a pornographic magazine is the worst <laughs> nose injury, industry, uh, <laughs> injury in history. So I suppose it was um, it was a movie about the bloke. You, you didn't got, quite get uh, the Wally Lewis medal, but you, you no, got that no, kind I got of that. Yeah, I got an inside of a porn magazine, so with, that, with a busted nose. Um, yeah, and as it turned out, in the last minute of the game, some guy was having a bad bad trot, didn't play too well, and he ran 30 metres across the field and cocked his elbow and put it on the enemy nose. Oh, and man. 
There's a uh, a good side and a bad side. Is that the good side? Obviously, I become a is that how you get confused for being Jeff, Jeff Fennick? Is it is <laughs> exactly uh, the bad <laughs> the side of it is my palate split down my throat, so you can't see that. My teeth come right up into my cheeks, and you can only see the broken nose. But my teeth come into my cheeks, my palate split down my throat, and um, I end up getting uh, a lot of mental health problems still to this day from that that actual injury. So quick, really, how does that get into quickest way to your brain? H- it's up through your palate. So I've had, got a lot of brain damage up through the palate. Wow. That day, so I didn't wear a mouth guard before the game. Um, where I'm actually holding my mouth is I'm actually holding it looking for my teeth. So I'm going, where are my teeth? <laughs> and I didn't know I had a busted nose. And the old mate walks out and grabs my nose with that big white hanky. And I pushed him away and closed my eyes. And what are you doing, mate? I, yeah, I didn't even know my nose was broke. I thought my me, me, uh, teeth were on the side of my cheek. So as it turned out, my me, me teeth were still there. They weren't on the ground where I was looking for them. And uh, my palate spit straight down my throat. And uh, I end up getting ADHD pretty bad from that, and which still affects me to this day. But I'm a fit-looking rooster, and I, I fight me, me mental health with my fitness, which I'm very lucky to have. And beautiful family, of course. Yeah. Good on you. Well, Thanks, mate. I mean, uh, prior to this podcast, I mean, I was doing a lot of research around this. Um, so you, you're talking about mental health. It's something I didn't sure. really, I guess, plan on talking about around this podcast but it's something i'm quite passionate about because mental health at the moment it's it's there's a lot of stigma around it and Mm -hmm. how do you actually engage it how do you talk about it so good on you for a um saying it on this podcast um because i'll I'll run tours and a lot of people will book a trip for a couple of weeks for so many different reasons and quite often it's to escape something you know they could have family issues they could have mental health issues they just want to break why why do people go on a holiday why do people go traveling Mm. it's for mental health but how have you um when did you get diagnosed or when did you find out about say adhd oh just the erratic behaviors the not able to keep jobs not being content obviously any sportsman is never going to be content in anything they do because they such set such a high standard and they um they set their goals to realize their dreams and in a sport you can realize your dream at a young age pretty quick whether it's win a grand final pay for australia and all that sort of stuff and that's what you dream of as a sports person um personally as a sports person you actually get a result every weekend mm-hmm. in life you might not get a result for your whole life you might not get a result for 10 years you know you might go get all the study and done go get all the exams go get all the high income but is that a result maybe not become a big boss own your own business is that a result yeah get own your own house is that a result yeah so it might not happen forever so yeah yeah playing sport you get a result every weekend sometimes every day if you play enough sport um if you're a golfer and stuff like that, that don't need rest and recovery they can get a result every bloody day of the week actually win or loss you know so now they mention that it actually makes sense because adhd is um on, on this as well i've been diagnosed with adhd um so what that means is your dopamine and you, you have typical low levels of serotonin and adrenaline. So people who have ADHD go out and sort of seek this. Mm. So you could be misbehaving, you're sitting in the classroom, and you're like, oh, this is not exciting. So you act out to do something like that in a classroom environment. But then again, there's a blessing to it. And there's examples of that. They say, um, one of the best ways, uh, Richard Branson, mm. got ADHD. Justin Timberlake, ADHD. Uh, it's just one of the famous actors. But the point is they can go seek out these new activities and rise to it. So it, it's actually an advantage having ADHD in those sort of moments. So perhaps, I mean, if you're playing footy, you've got all this intense amount of energy. You might be able to unleash that on the footy field. But then what do you do once you... Footy, when, when did you retire from yeah, rugby well, league? 2004, I, I kicking and screaming at the age of um, 32. So I wasn't ready to retire. But I, I believed in loyalty and I never wanted to play against Newcastle. If, the town gives you two tick tape parades and they come out 30,000 people each weekend to support you. You don't want to go play against them. So I had the opportunities to go play th- with Russell Crowe, South Sydney and go over to yeah, England and all that sort of stuff. But I thought if I leave Newcastle, I'll miss any working opportunities for the rest of my life. Yeah, yeah. If I, um, regardless of the income. And if I go and um, play for a side that's going to walk me into this stadium over here with a different colour jersey on. I just wouldn't be accepted. It just wouldn't be Does the club still like honour any of that? Like the, the service that you've given to the club? No. no they don't know me anyway. I, I, I kicked up s- such a big uh, drama when I left that I was still I was put out of the game and I'd play for nothing and all this sort of stuff. And that sort of embarrassed the club a bit. So they don't really give me much anymore. They, wow. They might give me a phone Despite call. Despite being loyal to, yeah. to dedication. They don't see that. I mean, it's changed hands two or three times now. So it's a different club owns it all together. Being West Group before that was. Nathan Tinklin, I was on the board of directors at 
voted Nathan Tinkle through and I was the only board of director that didn't vote him through. So right. things like that. I, I was I was pretty passionate about the club and still to this day I am. But yeah, yeah, I'll go yeah. sit on the hill and have a few beers with whoever's there and, and enjoy the game and enjoy the young Ponga that plays in my position as much as, <laughs> much as anyone. So I just hope he hurts himself and doesn't come the new number one fullback and I stay number one for the rest number of the one. Point. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. No, that tech soy goes pretty good. But yeah, yeah no, yeah. I, I, I um, didn't get the ADHD. I obviously, you had a high income back then too. So massive high income. You're doing something you love. So you don't know you've got any problems. Um, that created a massive problem. The head injury, which led to, you know, sit on cliff faces and um, drink a lot of beer and trying to jump off and all that sort of stuff. And wow. you always jump back into life. And the way I accommodated it was with um, insane training, not just training insane training so i just go up and run 100 k's just for fun and i went and done the ironman triathlon at port macquarie in 10 hours which is just one and a half hours off the professionals untrained i just showed up with a bike and swum and rode oh. and i just because i was sick and when i finished all i wanted from the people they wanted to interview me and they were trying to put needles in your arm and give you all your um what do you call it fluids back in your body and all that sort of stuff yeah yeah and i'm yeah. just pushing them away just ask them for a beer just will someone <laughs> go get me a beer i just want to have a beer They're a weapon. and i just couldn't <laughs> believe it, it it's finished because that 10 hours on the course no one could hassle me i didn't have to pay no bills i had you know nothing but my own freedom and it's the things you just don't get in life you know you don't get a chance to have 10 hours of work and have that much fun you know sort of thing so I, just for me personally um because you're owned by this town for a long time and if I want to go have fun in this town, it's, it's not my own fun. It's the next person walking past and you're asking questions or signing autographs, which I love, and adore. But it's never your time in this town. So out in that course, no one can get hold of me. No one can get hold of me in the swim. No one can get that's hold of me. You, in that's for you. That's that's that it's in the moment. It's, me. Yep. it's like being very present in that moment mm. whilst having intense exercise. And when you exercise, you know, shake the body around. It's really good yeah, for you. You yeah, get you get your dopamine. Like you're talking about. So yeah, I don't yeah. use them words because I can't spell them. Um, <laughs> But yeah, and it, it was, and then become an addiction. And I'd have that endorphin raise for three or four months, and I'd just go, that was amazing, what else can I do? So I'd go run 100 k's, you know, run Kokoda, and, all, and I was just doing stupid stuff. And I had told you before, I was in a wheelchair and done 100 k's at Christmas time in a wheelchair just because I was stupid. <laughs> and and yeah, I, I tore a calf, and I said, well, I can't do it in a calf, and a friend rang up and said, use my wheelchair, and I was stupid enough to go do it in a bloody wheelchair. And, <laughs> You try going up some of these hills in around Newcastle in wheelchairs. <laughs> it's not bloody fun. Trust me. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, I, I, I fight with my physical fitness um, that problem. And mate, and, and the good things about what I've done in sport, obviously, that, that's a downside. Um, having a big injury at the end of the career and all that sort of stuff. But when you're talking about travel, mate. Traveling was the main part of me sport. I loved it. Every, every weekend, you're traveling somewhere, whether it's within Australia, or whether it's around the world. The end of the seasons, the end of season trips, mate. You just see what's the best like because we had the, the yeah, income yeah. and you see what was the best location because you got go like to. an away game than a home game away yeah, game pr primarily so You're with your best you mates back. in a bus every day creating you know dreams that last forever memories that last forever and at the end of the season you're jumping on planes to cancun and checking out some of the best holiday <laughs> like with your best mates again and living that living that like the, the dream being you're it's a high i mean it's it's like kind of like almost like a rock star sort of lifestyle you're, you're on tv you're exactly getting well paid um, but where's your, where was the favourite away game? Like if you had to play footy somewhere, if it was in Newcastle, where, where's the hot spot? Yeah, well, being a Queenslander, obviously, I, I like going up home. Um, this is home now. But I thought Brisbane playing at Lang Park, um, the famous Lang Park when I was a kid, I thought that was pretty hot. And Lang Park being, was that Suncorp Stadium? Yeah, Lang, Lang Park was Suncorp. So Suncorp yeah, yeah. Stadium, we closed Lang Park. Knights, Knights Broncos closed Lang Park. Last ever game get played there, and we were the first game to open Suncorp Stadium. So it was amazing. Sort of, there's so much history behind Lang Park, and now there's so much history behind Suncorp Stadium already yeah, yeah, in this yeah. young age. So it's just amazing stadium that when Aside you're from the, the stadium, middle plane, what, what you feel like it? you're getting tripped. Like what oh. was so you'd fly into Brisbane and you are you originally from whereabouts? Tumba, just outside Tiba. of Brisbane. Yeah, but I was born in yeah. Penrith, just outside, just outside of Karajong down here in New South Wales, so I'm in Queensland. You, sorry, I'm just trying to reverse. Oh, it. it's where you play first senior. How game. did you? I thought you were you were always from Newcastle, so you, uh, but you no, played no, Queensland. No. That makes sense. Yeah, so yeah, I was born in Karajong um, when my dad came back from Vietnam War, um, based at Richmond, and went up to Queensland at the age of two, and by the time i was 15 16 i was playing first grade in toowoomba so 15 i was when i played first grade and that made me a queenslander by 
blooding through to senior yeah, grades. Make, yeah, makes sense. I was Queensland, and then by the time I was 18, I was back down here playing for Newcastle Knights. So Newcastle so. selected you. Like, how, how yeah, did you, didn't you go to the Broncos, or how did you make your way to Newcastle? Knights were playing the Broncos on a Sunday, and we'd played on Lang Park on a Saturday, and Knights were playing Broncos on a Sunday. And I'd scored two tries and got man of the match in this game, and all these clubs went to come and watch me. And Newcastle Knights just come over after the game and signed me pretty much in the dressing room. And um, then all the teams run the ne- rung the next day. So Canterbury rang, Broncos rang. We were all interested in signing you. So was that the way it works? So <laughs> I signed with Knights. Yes, so I didn't know there was like a, a bargaining thing going on. I just, yeah, and I just rang, signed straight away. And they done it pretty good. They well, guys like Mark Sarge and Paul Harrigan into get me sent it just that that worked yeah. pretty well <laughs> so how did you well what keeps in newcastle I'm, so now you like you've finished footy family yeah family yeah. um the memories i just i can never leave a town that give me so many memories it's just too bloody good and the town's just getting better and better and better every time you look oh, yeah there's the vineyards are getting bigger and better and more amazing mm. um the town is cleaned up the ships aren't coming in dirty with coal anymore they're coming in with passengers on them that without COVID, <laughs> coming with passengers on them that are uh, Drench in the vineyards and just yeah, yeah, loving yeah. life out there. So, mate, it's just turned into a beautiful town. They got this memorial walk that goes out over the beach that just really shows the whole of the city off. And hundred percent, um, where I suppose we become a little bit famous not only for the coal mine, but for putting a massive big tanker on the beach years ago in, during the storm, the Patch of Balker, <laughs> and, and that um, just to see that monument of a thing sitting, you know, ten meters off the beach, you can nearly touch it. And yeah, seeing yeah, it every yeah. day, it was bigger than any building we had in the whole city. And you don't realise how big a ship is until you have it sitting on your beach. And I was running my boot camps off that beach. And it was just amazing for the first week seeing this massive big thing just sitting there. You virtually had to do chin-ups on the on the side of it. <laughs> to You can't do that in Brisbane, can you? No you way. <laughs> and until a week later, um, you wouldn't even look sideways anymore. You just got sick of it seeing there. It was just still sitting there. And you go... Oh shit! I forgot that big shit was. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's amazing, amazing. So what have you been? What have you been doing post footy? Like, oh, actually, everything, everything. everything. Actually, let, let's. Can I say that question because um, what do you think your life would have been if you didn't make rugby league? As thief. Like I was leave. I was a thief. <laughs> yeah. Little town, nothing else to do. Um, just a little thieving bastard. I <laughs> But I, I got a lot of kicks up the ass when I was a kid, mate. I, I, honestly, I got that discipline, and you wouldn't do it these days to your kids. But I got hit that many bloody times as a young fellow. Not many ADHD. Dad, too. Made, dad made yeah. me. Dad made me a very brave young boy. So he would come and give me a smack on a Monday, and I'd look at him and go, "Mate, I've done nothing wrong." He says, "I know you haven't, son, but tomorrow you will." And then tomorrow would come, he'd smack me again. I said, like, "Dad, I've done nothing wrong." He so said, I know you haven't, son. Love to, maybe, yeah. maybe, maybe that's what hardened mate, you up to to this is the make it in the rugby. Me. By the time we got to Friday. You'd do something wrong. You'd play up. You'd break something, and Dad come and smack you again. <laughs> what was that for? I told you to do something wrong. So you just you get five smacks, and you you think you'd have credit by the next week. Next Monday, you get a smack again. <laughs> At least you get the weekends so off the smack. You got smacks play and being a thief instead of being a footy player. <laughs> <laughs> no, nah, mate. I was always going to be a hard worker, and I always was a dreamer, and I always worked hard to get, set me goals to make sure I was going to realise a dream. So I was very, very lucky in my sport. I broke a state long jump record at the age of 15 and I was Australian touch captain, you know, and I was, you know, So it seems like everything just would have been sport. Everything, everything would have been sport. So if you didn't excel at rugby league, it one. would have been something else because you're saying you, you'd run a boot camp down by the beach where the, yeah. the Pash Volca ship turned up and just blew up with the news. Yeah, that was so 2007. And that's pretty much it. We've, um, so you're running boot camps all, as well? Yeah, so I run the boot camp just once again for my own mental health, but if I see people show up and... At my boot camps, obviously got more problems than I got, so <laughs> I've got to change my mental health into excitement and, and How do they feel, like training with someone who is, you know, the, they, that, they hate that me. high high profile person around <laughs> they Newcastle? Hate me. They only like me for the first five minutes and they all hate me the bastards. <laughs> so you <laughs> no. give so you give some good amounts of tough love. You know, on, so, on so positive criticism is cool. Yes. Yeah, give me another one. No, okay, answer. we'll get it next time, but we'll <laughs> we'll always get there. This is for your own good. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. No, I, I I enjoy that side of it. Um, everything else I do would be, uh, you know, it, it's actually really hard. And talking about this, getting a result every weekend, it's, it's hard to, to go in the workforce and, and dream again and, and set goals. And, you know, people that have been in the workforce all their life, they know how to do that. And you'll never ever see a, a, a working person or a successful working person come into a room of athletes as a guest speaker. But you'll always see an athlete walk into a room of professionals yeah, and, that's interesting. And be the guest speaker because it's, we're all about goals and dreams and realising those and, and we sort of te- teach a lot of that. But yeah. I can't 
understand. I can't understand life. Life's got me. <laughs> life beats me. Life gets up and kiss, kicks me every day. And but shit, it was so easy in sport because I knew how to control that. Yeah. So at the moment, I'm yeah. I, I, I work as a dis, dis, disability worker, care worker, and I'm gone from you know twenty, thirty thousand people screaming name in the stadium to wiping someone's bum. You know, so it's it's not not that's that's a bad way of putting it, but that's just the way it is. And um, I'm not too proud to say you know, that's what I do for a living, but at the same time, is, I like doing that because not wiping the bums, <laughs> but I like, I like doing that personal care and I like doing disability work because it's mental health and mental health is gives back is g- <laughs> gives it, so it gives back, back directly on the front line it makes you a normal person it yeah, makes yeah. me work hard for what to, what to achieve and makes you grateful for everything you got in life actually you just jogged my memory um and if possibly if they're going to be watching this so shout out to there's an organization called the top blokes foundation uh they're central coast based and they're starting to expand but they've recently to my knowledge um possibly starting to collaborate with the nrl at the moment and you might be able to shed some light on this because it's only recent. It's only the last couple of years because the reason being, if there's a lot of teenagers working really hard and they're going to make the top grade, um, their their focus, their intensity goes 100% straight into being a footy player and school secondary. Definitely. But if you don't make... Oh, you're fortunate. You, you've beyond made the top grade, you know, represented Australia. Um, but these people that might make the, the second grade, just they, they nearly made it, but they were so focused on footy and they didn't wh- where do they go as you're saying like Mate, where, I, I, where was that support where was that structure where was and that coaching? a lot of guys my era went the other way where we were taken out of school at the age of 15 to play professional sport so we put our education aside to become sportsmen as these kids are doing but when we made it uneducated yeah, so, yeah. and then we give control of our finances to managers and people that just want to line their pocket most of the time and by the time you retire, you've got a million dollar mortgage, and if you're lucky enough to do that, and um, not a brain in your head to earn money anymore, you go, oh, uh, if you're not managed properly, you turn around and go, shit, I've got to go work. Yeah, and yeah. What do I do? Yeah. My first job out of sport was um, a real estate agent because I was sponsored by the real estate agency, and they were paying my third party contract, and I went, oh, well, I'll go become a real estate agent because they, um, worst thing I could have done, I made myself. Um, <laughs> accessible to the public mm. or making myself unaccessible on a football field and just come and stand behind a fence to shake my hand and get what they want out of me and, and get their love and make me the rock star theme and the pedestal um, was great but all of a sudden these people can, can get to you and if you become a businessman they get, you can use it two ways you can use it for your strength and become rich and famous and all that sort of stuff boy so what, what happened being a real estate agent all of a sudden put on the um, phone numbers on every single <laughs> every single bloody pole around that said for sale on it, which meant the guys on the way home from the pub two o'clock in the morning had my phone number and they were ringing me, hey, Robbie, I've just got your sign, mate. I'm out at bloody Shortland and, <laughs> and get, oh, I'm sorry, man. But I'm just, and then you get messages all night and then you go around the next day, you'd have to replace the for sale sign because some, some guy's <laughs> taking it. And then you go do a home inspection somewhere from a, <laughs> a rental. And you'll see 15 year Robbie O'Davis' size with four oh, so a lot of it this bloke's house. It, was, wow. it, was, it happened all the time. So it wasn't a, wasn't a good thing. And uh, my depression set in. Uh, one day in particular, <laughs> Joey Johns put in the paper that they lost 10 games in a row, the Newcastle Knights, and, um, and we just need our fullback back. You know, he's not going to make us win a game. Um, they'd just retired me. But he's just what we've seen there for so long. When the ball goes up, you know, we turn around and it's just Robbie catching the ball and running it back. And that starts our sets. That makes us such a good team when we used to be at our prime. So we just need our fullback back. So I made a thing in the paper saying I'll play for nothing, all that sort of stuff. And I was sitting in an open house on a Saturday afternoon and Newcastle Knights were playing Gold Coast, I think it was. And I was listening to Gary Harley on the, the radio, the old um, the radio announcer. And the Knights are losing again. And, you know, 30,000 people in the stadium started screaming my name. And I could hear it on the news. Wow. I could hear it on the radio. And I closed the open house and cried all the way home and fell into about a year of depression. Lost, lost everything. Lost wow. every cent I had. And uh, didn't work, didn't pay bills, didn't, just lost everything, mate. That's so. something that oh, – I thank you so much for sharing that. I mean, yeah. it's, it's – so many people would hold on to that as something quite closed off. Um, so I do appreciate you sharing that because yeah, well, to, it's to it's spread that message is about – It's particularly mental health to go on, a, on, a, on a pedestal. It's lovely. When you're yeah. on there – it's the most amazing feeling in your life. I, mean, I remember going down the 97 Grand Final, 2001 Grand Final, and seeing 
um, trucks on the side of the road with girls on the back with their pulling their tops up, and we're just like, like I said, they're rock stars. Oh, yeah. hang yeah. on, I couldn't get my phone number out to them quick enough. Sorry, I'm just joking. <laughs> I was Got a game to, to play. The window, like Rodney Roode by the time. Pull over. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, and it's just we come to that point where the pedestal's great, and then when you get off the pedestal, where do you go? Where like, do you go? You don't want to be put yeah. on it, and when you get put on it, you go, oh shit. Am I ready for this? And there's some guys that aren't ready to put on. There's guys in the past that you see that just weren't ready for fame and they were really, really good kids and they're still to this day good kids and they're great football players. Todd Carney's a really good effort. Like he's one of them. So guys like that that were just never ready to play the fame game. They just didn't know what it was like to be on a pedestal. When they got there, they went, this is fun. Let's go wreck, yeah, wreck yeah, ourselves, yeah, wreck the yeah. joint. Wreck, and then, boom, hang on, they're back the off rock again. That rockstar lifestyle, I guess, yeah. yeah. But, well, I mean, if you're a rock star and that happens to you, it's cool. No, it's but popular. Yeah. You can't do it as a sporting athlete. Nah, 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 no, no, no way. Uh, yeah. But anyway, that's 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 what I done. <laughs> and, um, like I said, but the best parts of my life were the friends I made, obviously, out of the sport, the memories I got out of the sport, mm. and obviously what you're into, mate. The, the tourism side of things, the traveling I done was just amazing. Still to this day, believe it or not, of the Cancun and the Vegas, and just having your best mates in the. Biggest party just where's your where's your favourite travel spots for Robbie? Like in New South Wales at the moment because we've just opened up the borders. And there's a big push for visit New South Wales to experience everywhere. So, what's some tips you could give if you weekend away for New South Wales? Where would you go? Mate, within 100 kilometres of Newcastle, we've got some magic destinations. Yeah, <laughs> don't got to go any further. Than what's your favourite? Newcastle. This place called Harrington at the moment. Harrington. It's um you just head up the coast just past Foster yep. and. You've just got some beautiful big pubs on the, right on the water and then you've got a uh, Irish pub out the back on a, a bit of a golf course and then you've got it's just, just all beaches around you. So beautiful, nice and cheap to get up there and then you've got Manning, Manning Point on the other side which is um, just Mud Crab City. You go across there and drop a crab pot and you have a big Mud Crab for dinner. Mud, chili Mud Crab is a beautiful one. Um, then you come back in and you've got all places away from the beach like the Taree and stuff. So it's just off Taree. So then yeah. you work your way back. And as you work your way back, you just got your Foster Tankari all the way back, and then you jump past Newcastle, and you've got the entrance, which looks exactly like Foster Tankari. Yes, so it's just, yes, yes. It's just a picture of the same place. And so to anyone that's from Queensland, get that up here. It's New South Wales. Is, that's the number one spot, <laughs> eh? <laughs> yeah, Queensland for life, but maybe New South Wales got the edge on the, on the places as to be. As a kid, I love, to I love going to Gold Coast because Toowoomba is three party hours town. Australia's yeah. Australia's. Oh, you wouldn't live there. You'd never live there. My daughter just moved there, and I'm filthy on her for doing that. And um, and now she's got locked up there, so she can't get she home. She got locked can't, up. Yeah, well, she went out. Went out. I didn't want to let her go, so she said at 11:30 the night before the border closed. Oh, Dad, I've travelled up here pretty good, mate. You know, I've only got half an hour to go until I get out of the border. And and she's on the phone. I'm going, where, where are you? She goes, Oh yeah, I'm just jumping over the border to Queensland just before it closes. Why? Like, oh, you just because. Boom, gone. But she's up there. So, <laughs> just so she, she knew I wouldn't let her go. So she just jumped up there and jumped the board and now I can't get her. Oh, wow. <laughs> well, she's 22, so it's not as if I just can't see my grandson. She's take the grandson too. So <laughs> she'll be back. Yeah, they, they always come back. <laughs> All right. Well, um, I just want to start to wrap this up, but I want to go out on a bit of a high note. So just play a little bit of a game. So a little bit of fun. So I did this with the Lord Mayor of Newcastle, actually. I uh, sort of got off guard. So... Uh, a quite simple one. So I'm going to say a word and say the first thing that pops in your head straight away. All right, then. <laughs> All right. Brace himself. All right, number one, sneezing. <laughs> first word that pops in your head when you sneeze. Size of my nose. <laughs> <laughs> number two, fitness. Me. <laughs> Tell you what. Go on to Robbie O's Instagram. You are ripped, mate. So that, that's uh, that's a good call. I have to because my, my head's so ugly, so I've got to take the focus on my face. So, <laughs> <laughs> Next word. Instagram. Uh, TikTok at the moment. Yeah. Loving TikTok. <laughs> Loving TikTok. <laughs> I uh, know. Oh I was looking at you. Looking at you. go on to Robbie's um, Instagram. <laughs> you got some gold on there for TikTok. <laughs> my kids love me, kids. Okay. First thing popping in your head. Hunter Valley. Wine. Matthew Johns. Red Dragon. <laughs> Andrew Johns. Loose. <laughs> Cooking. Um, I know exactly what I'm going to say, but it's called Seafood Marinara. What's he go to? Yeah. High School. 
Uh, <laughs> um, representative sport. Donald Trump. Flip. <laughs> flip. <laughs> Rich flip. Oh, man. Oh, he's insane. All right, and a couple more things. Um, so I'm just going to say a sentence, and then you've got to finish it off. Oh, okay. <laughs> what did Donald Trump do? The first, the first morning ritual I do is... Um, give the, the hugs and kisses a hugs and kiss. <laughs> the misses a kiss. Warm and kind. Mm-hmm. When I go to the shopping centre, I shop for... Um... Anything? Yeah. Is that, I'm you don't grocery, go shopping. Usually gross. No, no. no. <laughs> usually bread and milk because I'm something we forget the next day. So I'm always got to go back and get bread and milk. Yeah. All right. Two more things. Once I finish my weekly weekly wax and polish of my two premiership rings, I would then use them to get in any nightclub. <laughs> <laughs> Last one. When a rugby league fan of an opposing team yells out profanity to, profanity to me on the field, I would. Um, point to the bigger guy next to me and tell it was, it was directed <laughs> at them. <laughs> oh, <laughs> was that boy. you that were talking to then? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm only ever getting bagged by Terry Hill. That was easy. Just give him a finger that way. Yeah, that's it. Well, no, um, no, I'm, I'm pretty good. Oh, I'm, mate. I never got views much other than me, me no story and shit. I suppose uh, <laughs> it must be challenging. I mean, you know, someone like myself doesn't know what it's like to be running on a field with thousands of people. But, um, but yeah, I'd like to really thank you for, for coming down and having this chat on this podcast because, um, especially for the for the town of Newcastle. Yep. Um, I've just recently watched the. Um, have you seen the documentary of Netflix uh, with Michael Jordan called The Last Dance? Definitely have. Oh man, like the way that. They described what the Chicago Bulls did to Chicago with Michael Jordan and all these quality players because they described like they had a shit team mm. and there wasn't much and then all these quality players turned up and then you say Chicago Bulls around the world like they become a cultural icon. But I really thought there's a lot of cross references also to that to yourself like because mm. Newcastle had Andrew Johns, Matthew Johns, Paul Harrigan, big names of the town, and yourself, you know. And and there was a there was a core bunch of players that Newcastle didn't have much of a footy team then rose up, and as you say, like, you, you're a part of a, a shift or a change in rugby league where it was just dominant, you know, like thousands of people just jamming back in the stadium just watching people like yourselves, you know, like, you know, you had, like, Dennis Rodman, Scotty Pippen, Michael Jordan for the basketball in rugby league community. You, you were part of that. So it's something to be quite quite proud of, I, th- I think. I think when you cross reference in the two teams, we still dominated these days our um, TV by... Matthews, the um, Joey's, the McDougal, the yeah. Man Chiefs, Shake, Matty John guys, Show, um, Channel Nine, Mark Hughes, so all these guys are still dictating yeah. the airways. Yeah. So you look back at the guys over there; they're still dict- dictating the airways. It's That's a lot it. Of that era, a lot of yeah. the guys from um, either the Jordan or Dennis Rodman's facilitating peacekeeping missions with oh, North geez, Korea. Like that level of having but earrings got, in their nose. They got to that <laughs> level, but as you say, like you, you yeah. know, you, you're a part of this dynamite. Uh, quality team that that's still kicking on now, and that's um not many people can so, say uh, that. So, and mate, the, the town reacted, hopefully what what we expected, and it gave us something more. The one thing that was disappointing, I thought most about two thousand one was Newcastle only party with us for two days afterwards because they they knew how hard they were going to go. So, what it did was bring a lot of people from out of town. So they went, geez, ninety seven was such a big party. Yeah, I'm going to go join this party. So we had all these people from the country, all the people from Sydney, don't mind them at all, but by Tuesday, Thursday, not Tuesday, Wednesday, everyone had gone home and from Newcastle and then we just had these people sort of just hanging around and just hanging on and hanging on and hanging on. We had no time to ourselves. By, but in 97, it was just all Newcastle people and they would party with you, but they mm. knew we were going to leave you alone. Oh, just let them, I spoke to them last night, so, but I just <laughs> go where they are because that's where the party is. Yeah, yeah. I just leave them alone. But 2001 was like, People just buying our ears all day and all day and all day. So, like we said, that's part of the profile of personal work. But it just wasn't as enjoyable um, because we didn't know a lot of the people, I, I guess. But obviously, mate, Joey was out of control in by, <laughs> by 2001 <laughs> and made a lot of the young kids probably follow him <laughs> down like yeah. the Pied Piper a little bit. And yeah. Um, But, yeah, I was just happy just to sit in the corner and, and watch all the <laughs> – uh, most of the time. <laughs> Sometimes. <laughs>
boy. No, I had a ball. That's it. That's it. Had a ball. Had a ball. It was unreal. Well, Robbio, thank you so much. I'd shake your hand, but we are currently 1.5 metres apart. So oh, <laughs> I know. Share a drink. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Appreciate it. Thanks so much. Hey, thanks very much for your time.